So please let's give a big warm welcome for Robert Shear. Thank you. Uh, back in 1992, when President Bush, the other President Bush, announced the end of the Cold War, uh, he said the Soviet Union has died, uh, and uh, the reason for our big arms industry is over. He instructed his Secretary of Defense uh, to have, make a 30% cut in West spending, and his Secretary of Defense, a man named Dick Cheney, did just that. And it wasn't really all that controversial. It made perfect sense. Uh, many of these weapons were designed, we certainly had already the biggest arsenal in the world, and we had intimidated, according to the Reaganites, the old Soviet Union. We, there was no match in sight. And most of the weapons that were being planned were being designed to defeat a Soviet enemy that was expanding. So, for example, the stealth bomber, the F-22, the new subs, all were based on the idea the Soviets would develop new technology, new radar, more effective fighters, more effective ships, and so forth. And so it was quite logical when the first President Bush announced that we don't need these weapons anymore and uh, instituted this 30% cut. And I thought at that moment that uh, that was it for these kinds of discussions. And, uh, but I should have reread General Eisenhower's farewell address when he warned about the military industrial complex, which has a life quite independent of any threats or needs. Indeed, when Eisenhower issued that uh, famous warning in his farewell address, he certainly faced a serious enemy. The enemy was certainly armed, and he was not in any way trying to underestimate the threats but what he was calling attention to in that farewell address was that this military industrial complex with its tentacles in each congressional district had a life of its own. And that represented two threats. One, uh, a threat to soak up resources that could go for other purposes. And secondly, that when one builds these weapons, one wants to inflate, exaggerate the threat, and one wants to find reasons to use these weapons. So that's sort of why I thought it was over, but I should have, would have known better had I read Eisenhower. I just want to read something from my book that kind of sets the stage. People never tell, I don't ever know how long you're supposed to speak at these things, uh, but I figure every, you people gave up part of your evening, so we can have something of a discussion and then have a question period. I just want to read you, this is a speech, uh, and I'll just, I won't tell you the author of the circumstance. The topic today is an adversary that poses a threat, a serious threat to the security of the United States of America. This adversary is one of the world's last bastions of central planning. It governs by dictating five-year plans. From a single capital, it attempts to impose its demands across time zones, continents, oceans, and beyond. With brutal consistency, it stifles free thought and crushes new ideas. It disrupts the defense of the United States and places the lives of men and women in uniform at risk. Perhaps this adversary sounds like the former Soviet Union, but that enemy is gone. Our foes are more subtle and implacable today. You may think I'm describing one of the last decrepit dictators of the world, but their day too is almost past and they cannot match the strength and size of this adversary. The adversary is closer to home. It's the Pentagon bureaucracy. Now that wasn't said by Noam Chomsky or Gore Vidal, it was said by Donald Rumsfeld. It was a speech he gave at the Pentagon to assembled high brass, uh, uniformed and civilian, and unfortunately it's a speech he gave on September 10th, 2001. And in that speech he said, and talking about the problem with the Pentagon, we have misplaced trillions of dollars his expression. We can't get people on one floor in this building to talk to one on another floor. We are at the mercy of people who invent reasons for weapons. And he presented as scathing a portrait, and as discussed it in the book, of this military industrial complex, as you can imagine. But the next day, with the 9 11 attack, all bets were off. The plans were dusted off, and the uh, promise of, of George Bush, his father, 
that uh, we would now be giving this money back to taxpayers. We would now be using this money to spend on needed domestic programs that have been starved uh, was, off, was off. Within a very short time, the president asked for $20 billion without even knowing what had happened. And now we have spent trillions. And since that time, we have come to spend, we now spend more than all of the nations in the world combined, all combined on the military. We now spend more in constant inflation adjusted dollars than at any year since World War II, more than during the Vietnam War, more than during the Korean War. And it takes up six out of every $10 in our, what's called the discretionary part of the federal budget. By that I mean if you take out Social Security, you take out Medicare, and having been on a speaking tour and having spoken to audiences that make this one seem quite youthful, I can tell you no one is touching Social Security or Medicare. People will bring their muskets out uh, and because they are two enormously <coughs> successful programs. And certainly the idea of uh, tying them to private, social, private uh, Wall Street accounts now seems absurd in today's moment, so that's not going to happen. And, uh, you know, and, and I think even many younger people realize were it not for Medicare and Social Security, uh, I knew this because my mother was uh, 88 when she died and she lived with me, were it not for those programs, it's, you know, this thing of pitting one generation against the other, the burden, the obligation would fall on the children and the grandchildren. And once that sinks into people, no one wants to cut those programs, nor should they. And we aren't going to increase taxes. So when it comes time for the Congress to think about, should we have better uh, levies, a program that was rejected, we may recall. Should we rebuild New Orleans? New Orleans? Uh, should we improve education, science? Should we extend health care to uninsured children? Should we help people save their homes in the subprime mortgage scandal? Any of those programs that are being discussed by the candidates, issues being dealt with by the candidates, now, there will not be money for those programs if you do not cut the military budget. Will not be. That's the six out of ten dollars that now go to the military. So the question then is, why is this not discussed in the election? Why is it the elephant in the room that no one will talk about? You know, and uh, you know why? Uh, and I have great respect for both candidates, by the way, uh, I do, and uh, yet. And they're not stupid people, they're very bright. They know what I'm talking about. And they won't touch it. They won't touch it because it's the third rail issue. They won't touch it because jobs are dependent upon it and because campaign contributions are dependent upon it. And yet if you don't discuss that issue, you really can't talk about future spending patterns and programs. Let me just give you one example. And I may disappoint people by giving a surprisingly nonpartisan or bipartisan analysis here. And uh, no, I'm not trying to tell you, I mean, I'll tell you, right, let me put my cards on the table. Yes, I'm going to vote for Barack Obama. I'm very excited about him. No, no, I mean, so so, so uh, that's not the subject of tonight's discussion. And one of the uh, individuals here asked me to talk about what the candidate should do and so forth. So I'll get to that uh, as requested. But my point is that, and, and it may be that Barack Obama will surprise me. It may be that we will get a president who will actually move uh, against this issue and problem and do something, but I am wary of it. And I just want to give uh, some indication of why. I think if you don't discuss these things in the election, you don't have a snowball's chance in hell of doing something about them after, because you haven't built a constituency for it. And I'll give you just an example that I found very disquieting. And, uh, and that was the Democratic National Committee last week attacked John McCain for shipping jobs abroad by having criticized an airplane leasing program for Boeing. All right, that was the Democratic National Committee attacked McCain. And what had McCain done? McCain was sitting there in the Senate and John Warner, the chair of the committee, and suddenly there was a $35 billion item in the budget. There had not been any committee hearings, no discussion, the Pentagon had not expressed any interest, really, in this. And there was this $35 billion, we're talking B here. I know we have a lot of trouble because we get the truth. $35 billion. For example, the extending child care health care to the 4 million uninsured children. That was a $6, 7000000000 billion program, okay? 
So, and that was vetoed by George Bush because he thought it was too expensive, covering four million children. So here you have initial cost uh, estimated $35 billion program uh, that everyone said was going to grow to be a $100 billion program. And Warner condemned it, as did McCain, as the biggest boondoggle yet in defense history. And what was it? Boeing was in trouble because they made commercial jets and the main airlines were not buying jets because after 9-11, air traffic was down. How can we help Boeing out? Well, Boeing has commercial planes that are not being used. Let's lease them and turn them into mid-air fuel tankers. Sound like a good idea. And uh, we'll lease them. And as McCain pointed out, we were going to lease them at a cost $6 billion higher than if we bought them outright. All right? And no one could quite figure out what these fuel tankers were supposed to do. And that, there were no hearings, there were no discussions, so it really didn't matter. And McCain, in one of his better moments as a public official, and there have been good moments, I won't demonize McCain tonight. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, th there have been good moments. Campaign finance reform, certainly a good moment. Uh, his opening to North Vietnam in partnership with John Kerry and the extending diplomatic relations to Vietnam and normalization of relations took courage. He was attacked for it. Now, of course, we're assaulted by Vietnamese shrimp uh, that dominate our, our, our market. But um, I'm, I'm not disparaging McCain's contribution, but this was probably one of, uh, this was his, one of his better moments. And what McCain did is he put a telescope on a problem that we never discuss. And he demanded the emails. He demanded the traffic. And I'm not going to go through the whole story. There's a chapter in my book on that particular scandal. But as a result of his diligence and Warner's, to Republicans, the chief financial officer of Boeing went to federal prison, the top procurement officer in the Air Force went to prison, and the CEO of Boeing resigned. It was that bad a scandal. And the top procurement officer in the Air Force, and mind you, this is also all after 9-11, all when we're concerned about enemies out there, all when we're concerned about national security, all when we're expected to make sacrifices. And it began, and when you look through the case study, which I have in the book, uh, what happened was the chief procurement officer and the Air Force, who had been there a long time, needed a job for her son-in-law, she needed a job for her daughter, and finally she needed a job for herself. And the bidding war started between Lockheed and Boeing uh, for her services. And if you look at a GAO report just two weeks ago, you can get it online on the revolving door between the Pentagon and the uh, defense contractors. It's spinning faster than ever, you know. Uh, and this was a perfect example. These people get out, they then do business with the people who had the desk next to them back in there, and they work it out. And uh, there's a wonderful letter, a uh, speech in my book, which I report from Boeing's lawyer. The Seattle Times happened to get a hold of it, uh, talking about why all the people they're dealing with are starting to think of themselves as horrible crooks. And he goes through one case after another, and the one that I'm mentioning was just one. But anyway, she got a job. Uh, Boeing beat off Lockheed's overtures, and then this thing exploded. She was already at Boeing. But while the negotiations had taken place, while the hundreds of thousands of dollars in salary and titles and everything were being discussed, she was still dealing with contracts. Now, thanks to McCain and Warner, the project got uh, stopped. And uh, there was a lot of anger. The trade unions who represent workers in that industry, the politicians who get money from them, the executives and so forth. And it, as I say, is a, unquestionably a very good thing for McCain to have done. But why did the Democratic National Committee attack him last week? Because as a result, jobs were lost to Boeing. And now that contract is back on the table to make a new plane and everybody's happy. And Boeing is competing with Airbus uh, you know, and, and uh, Northrop Grumman uh, to make this plane. And the other day, and all the papers have treated it as a jobs program. This is kind of a decadent socialism, if you like. <laughs> and there's no way I can explain it. The Wall Street Journal had three columns on their front page. The New York Times had a big story. Everyone had to, no one discussed what this plane is, why do we need this tanker refueler up there in the sky? We have refuelers, why do we need it? And the only tip off in the New York Times story was they actually had a picture. And the picture showed, you know, it's kind of a strange little picture. It showed uh, the refueler with the rod out, 
going into a B2 stealth bomber, okay? And, oh, well then at least from the picture you could say, well maybe that's why we need it. Now the B2 stealth bomber, which replaced the B1 stealth bomber, which replaced the B52, why did we need those? We needed them primarily and for, because we used to have a pol policy called mutual assured <laughs> destruction in the height of the Cold War. And that policy was based on the notion if the Soviets engaged in a first strike, we had to have the threat of a retaliation that was survivable. In order to do that, we had to have three wings of our forces. We had the land-based missiles, so instead, if they took those out, no reason to believe they could, but if they did, we then had the missiles on ship. And if they took those out, then we had the bombers up there on 24-7 going around with nuclear weapons. That was mutual assured destruction, okay? And it never really made sense because you could just imagine one of these b bomber pilots up there and he knows his country is destroyed. He knows the one-sixth of the world that was the old Soviet Union has been destroyed uh, because after all, there were 5,000 uh, weapons going to be going off on each side. And these are nuclear weapons of much greater power than the ones that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the primitive little weapons, fat man and little boy. But still, in this bizarre nuclear war fighting strategy, the idea was he's up there and he sees some sign of life, and instead of embracing it, destroys it, <laughs> knowing full well that he has nowhere else to go. You know, so he's going to crash the plane. OK, now I only bring this up because here you have certainly something we don't need, all right? And, uh, and its purpose no longer exists. No one can defend it. Even in its day, it was difficult to defend because one problem with the stealth bomber uh, is that its covering came off in the rain, and that was a bit of an embarrassment. <laughs> uh, but maybe they worked that out. But the reality is the whole stealthiness that was required and everything was designed to defeat, penetrate a Soviet uh, surveillance system, uh, radar system that they never developed. They collapsed in, a, in, in sort of a great tragedy uh, for the military industrial complex, their collapse. And so you had these planes. And now we dust this thing off. And that's the end of my hero worship of John McCain. So don't please don't leave <laughs> early. Uh, <laughs> when I think I'm losing the crowd on this one, I always mention that I was born exactly the same year uh, as McCain. And I tell you, if you'd been with me uh, today trying to find this public radio station in Miami, you would know I cannot run the country. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't. I don't think I would remember who called at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, let, let alone. But I bring it up because I want to indicate, even to what I presume is a, a, probably a largely democratic crowd, uh, that it, the problem is clearly bipartisan. Let me give you another example of this. Uh, I was at a dinner party in Los Angeles, and uh, uh, Barbara Boxer, who's the senator that I have voted for, a very liberal Democrat, and I've known her since she was a supervisor in Marin County, California. And I'm at this dinner party, and uh, Richard Reeves, the uh, author, uh, was there, his, his house. And I can talk about it because he wrote a whole column about something else that happened there. And I called him, and he said, well, the whole party was on the record, so I'll take his word for it. But anyway, at this party, somebody mentioned that I had this book, and it was in galleys, and I was working on it, and I had to leave early, actually. And Barbara Box said, oh, what's it about? And, she's, and then McCain came up, and she said, well, I hope you criticize. I said, I, well, actually, McCain, in my book, oddly enough, I didn't know he'd be the front runner, comes out looking a little better than you do, Senator Boxer, <laughs> because, and she said, what do you mean, you know? And I really admire this woman, I voted for her, I think she's gutsy, she's great, and so forth, and which just indicates the dimension of the problem, right? This is a woman with her head screwed on right, decent, thorough, et cetera. And I said, well, you have been pushing this uh, C-17 cargo plane that has no purpose, no use. The Pentagon doesn't want it. They've been trying to mothball it for 10 years. And you do it because you think it's a good jobs program in Long Beach, where it's made. And I said, why don't you just take a small portion of that money and retrain these workers to make mass transit or something, or give them a, a golden parachute? You know, have an early retirement, have a buyout. But why do you want to make a plane that we don't need? She said, oh, no, no, it's a wonderful plane. She said, have you been in it? That's what they always say, because they get to fly around in these things. I, I said, no, I haven't been in it, but, but what is it supposed to do that we need? And she said, uh, well, you know, in Iraq, we have to ship things. Okay, now even if you accept that Iraq was a good war and necessary, remember, and all that, 
The fact is, it's not true. It's not true that you needed to ship things because over 90% goes in by ship. And in fact, 100% probably should go in by ship because it's a very small fraction of the cost of flying stuff in, much less risky. But if you want to fly stuff in, we have FedEx and UPS that actually, <laughs> no, they actually do this. And in addition, we have a very large cargo fleet, okay? So there was no need for this plane. Yet there was something called the Red Alert Team in Long Beach. Barbara Box was a key member. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Republican governor, key member. Uh, Dana Rohrbacher, one of the most right-wing congressmen from Orange County, a key member. The city council, the labor unions. And any time it looked like this plane was uh, in trouble, okay, they sounded this red alert alarm. You wish they had done that over 9-11 and Al-Qaeda coming, but it didn't happen. <laughs> over the possible loss of this plane, everyone gets rallied bipartisan, and they get the funding to keep it going. I can go through a whole long list. And the numbers add up, you know, the F-22 fighter pilot plane, for instance, to, to defeat, again, stealthy, defeat a Soviet radar didn't develop, uh, to defeat Soviet planes that were never built. And the F-22 is an enormous embarrassment. Uh, just last week, um, the Secretary of Defense, Gates had to, he fired the um, top military and civilian officers in the Air Force. Now there was a specific charge that they the B-52 had flown around with all these nuclear, nuclear weapons and nobody knew where it was and so forth. There was also the other matter of high-tech missile technology being sent off to Taiwan where it was not supposed to go. Uh, but the other charge that was in there that didn't make any attention at all was that these people were trying to get 100 more of these F-22s. Okay, and, and Secretary Gates said, we don't need them. Now the F-22 has yet, has yet to fly a sortie in either Iraq or Afghanistan, all right? I can go down the list of the planes, the weapons, the subs that were dusted off. Let me uh, give you just one last example in that regard, and that re concerns our Virginia-class submarines, all right? Uh, this is a program that Joseph Lieberman, somebody I voted for when he was running for vice president, uh, feels we must have, and he has been pushing. And uh, it's very difficult to defend not just one new sub a year, but two at a cost of at least two and a half billion dollars each to take on Al-Qaeda, the terrorist enemy, right? That doesn't have a dinghy or a rowboat. <laughs> and it, it's very difficult to use a submarine to get at those people in the caves. So, so what happens with Lieberman, and, and this is a program, by the way, booming ahead. This is ultimately a $75 billion program. I'm throwing these figures out there, but that's how you get the six out of ten dollars. That's how you get all this waste. You know, this is not, as I say, kidding around. So how does he justify it? And again, I have a chapter on, on the sub in there. And by the way, Lots of people like this program. It's not just Lieberman, who's now an independent, but you actually have a very liberal fellow who represents the community where m much of the construction is done in Groton, Connecticut. And he got elected by, I'm slipping on the number, it was either 53 or 54 votes margin. That was one of the votes that allowed the Democrats to take over the House. In order to save this guy who was baited by his Republican opponent, you don't know anything about getting defense money, this guy has to go to the races from day one and say, I will get more money than my Republican, the Republican incumbent ever got you. And the Democrats rally around him. Murder to all these people, Pelosi, everybody. Let's get him the money he needs so he'll have a bigger margin than 53 next time. All right? So it doesn't matter whether you're a liberal or conservative. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican because of what Eisenhower said. It extends everywhere. By design, it has a life of its own. So when Lieberman is giving his big speech, you know, to defend these subs, and it's not like we didn't have subs, right? We have subs that were, and it's not like the Soviets are coming back. The Russian subs leak so badly they don't allow them to go out of port, and their crews tend to be drunk. And uh, you know, okay, what is the new boogeyman? And it can't be the rogue nations and everything. They're not in that league. What is the new boogeyman? It's China. And here you get an absolutely the most absurd argument, because and an argument inconvenienced as all these arguments are by fact. And uh, because, if, I don't know if you noticed, but there were some changes in the last couple of weeks. There was an election in Taiwan, and the Guomindang won. Remember the Guomindang? That's the party that Chiang Kai-shek fled mainland China with to Taiwan, took over Taiwan. Well, the issue there was they wanted even closer relations with the mainland than the other party wanted. The other one also wanted to improve relations. So right away, the 
head of the Guomindang, went to the mainland, had a love fest, and so forth, uh, endorsed by the president. And this Friday, for the first time since the Chinese Communist Revolution, you will have direct flights from Taiwan to the mainland. Okay? And you have a marked increase in tourism. And Taiwan is already the second or third biggest investor in the mainland, ta Taiwanese businessmen. And they go back and forth. Okay? So here you have Lieberman yelling, the Chinese are going to beat us on these weapons. And the Chinese aren't playing the game. The Chinese, in fact, have reinvented, as have the Vietnamese communists, into a new form of capitalists. They believe in this trade stuff. And the Chinese communists have no control of oil to speak of. They haven't conquered anyone that has oil. And we are in the pathetic business that the French, the Russians, the Germans, the Spanish, the Italians were to prove that imperialism pays. And it doesn't. It pays for some. It pays for some companies. It pays for some individuals. But it does not pay for the average person. So while we have conquered the second largest pool of oil in the world, in addition to which we have devoted enormous resources over the decades to protecting the people who have the largest pool of oil, Saudi Arabia, right? right? The price of oil, did, the oil did not pay for the occupation, as Paul Wolfowitz had promised. On the contrary, the price of oil has now gone up sixfold, sixfold. And when I'm on right wing radio and people denounce me, as they tend to do, I say, boy, you really must love paying $4.50 a gallon. You know, why don't you conquer another country and see if you can't get it up to eight? <laughs> you, know, uh, well, you know, the fact is you're left protecting the pipelines, you're left protecting the shipping lanes, and it doesn't pay. And the Chinese actually pass on the cost. They're doing what old-fashioned free market capitalists are doing. They're doing what the first President Bush uh, was talking about when he talked about a new world order. They're talking about relying on trade, commerce, diplomacy, normalcy, rather than militarism and imperialism. You can quibble with the first President Bush, you know, uh, but the reality is that his vision was fundamentally at odds with his sons, okay? Mm -hmm. Fundamentally at odds. The, two, the big war we've had really is between the two Bushes. I'll leave it to you to tell me where Jeb would have come out, but um, <laughs> I don't know the answer. So how did we get to this impasse? How did we get from Bush 1 to Bush 2? This thing called 9-11 the threat. And as Eisenhower predicted, the people who build these weapons want to find reasons to use them. No one just wants to be ripping us off. They know it won't keep, the money won't keep coming. And so you had this moment of this gift, as I call it in the book, not a gift, obviously, to the people and the families that were hit, not the people live nearby, not the people in the countries we've invaded, but a gift to the military industrial complex that will not quit giving because the commitments now, they go 10, 20, 30 years up the road to defeat an enemy whose arsenal can be purchased at, you have Lowe's here or Home Depot, I always seem to get this wrong, both, okay? We are talking about $3 box cutters, you know, we're talking about knives, Leatherman knives, maybe $15, we're talking about little canisters of tear gas, okay? Nothing sophisticated. Now there are lots of things, I'm not going to underestimate terrorism, there are lots of things that can be done to deal, deal with it. I personally do not believe in the war imagery. I think of it as a pathology. I think you need surgical precision in going after it. I think you need a serious clinical analysis. But uh, there are many things, and I think it'll always be with us, and will, uh, and has, and will. You know, go to scripture and you'll see people through stones, right? Uh, you know, uh, you, that's terrorism is when you don't have the other weapons. And you will have it. You will always be cursed by it. Uh, and in that sense, it's a great gift to the military industrial complex because the war will never be won. You can wipe out all of these people and then there will be others. This happens. And it doesn't happen, by the way, and I'm not going to belabor this, I want to not take too much time and have questions, uh, but it happens with any religion. It's, uh, any, it could be secular. Secular people have committed terror, you know. Uh, uh, Christians, right? What were the uh, um, Irish uh, Catholics doing and the Irish Protestants? doing? Weren't they blowing up department stores, <coughs> killing people, right? They were following a Christian uh, ideology, uh, right? Uh, we had a Jewish terrorist, just a person who shot, killed uh, Isaac Rabin in Israel, 
right? The person who believed God has spoken to him. Uh, I never can myself, just on a personal note, and maybe why I keep writing these things and do this, I never have accepted that simple vision of you know the source of evil, rogue nation, despot there, this one, that one. And the reason is because I was born in 1936, it happened by an accident of my birth, that I had a father who had a very thick German accent and who was a Lutheran by upbringing uh, and come over from Germany. I had many relatives on that side of the family uh, who had come as recently as the 30s, come even after Hitler and so forth. And uh, so I had that whole family. And then I had a Jewish mother who had come uh, after the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, uh, where her group had been suppressed uh, by Stalin. And uh, she came and her relatives, and they were wiped out by my father's relatives who stayed in Germany. I've gone back uh, to this town in Germany. I have found my relatives. I found my uncle who uh, was wounded in Stalingrad. Um, and his wife went to work at the American Air Force Base in Rammstein, once was decided the Germans were really the good guys, and now the Russians were the bad guys. You know, that all happened and seemed like to my childish imagination in 24 hours. But when I finally found them, they, had, they all had very happy relations with the American bases and everything, and uh, a lot of Americans living in town. But I never, I, the question I was ra had to deal with as a kid was why, how could my father's family, coming out of a tradition that my father had always described as the high point of civilization, the country that had the best science, the best music, the, the, you know, everything. My father loved Germany, you know, uh, and everything about it, and all my relatives did. The best educational system in a Christian nation. Uh, how did it end up committing the greatest barbarism, right, of modern history? And that's an answer we just, a question, we just put away for the convenience of the Cold War. We suddenly needed them, we needed their scientists, they were our friends, Germany was divided, you know, and so forth and so on. And we ignored the great moral question of our time. I think the best answer to it, that's not the purpose of my book or discussion, was what Hannah Arendt said about the banality of evil. And every discussion I've ever had in Germany about this has gotten back to that. My uncle said, well, you know, uh, times were hard here, and then Hitler built his road over there, you know, Highway 6, I think it's now. And <coughs> little did he know that that was the road for the tanks to go conquer Paris. You know, uh, Hitler was a voice on the radio. Uh, life was hard. We had been assaulted, conspiracy of one kind or another, and so forth. But all my life, I've tried to deal with this question of how, where does this come from, this rage, uh, this violence and so forth. And I think this simple identification of the problem we have with a particular religion I think is not only a slander of that religion, but it misses the whole point, okay? But the main thing we, we have to take from this is that the way to approach it, to deal with it, is to understand it. There are things you can do. Uh, certainly at one point I make sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm all for spending money, genuine money on the war on terror. So for instance, at the time of the Gulf War, it was announced that the State Department only had seven people who knew classical Arabic. <laughs> a point I've been making, I don't know if it's improved very dramatically, a point I've been making is just go to the Starbucks near UCLA, <laughs> and you'll find, Westwood, and you'll find, and in any given night, a much larger number who know uh, not only Arabic, but know Farsi, you know, and they can help us. <laughs> and also know something about the Muslim religion and understand the divisions and so forth, which we did, clearly did not understand when we went in there and, and what have you. So there are many things you can do. You can have better body armor. You can have better uh, Humvees and so forth that don't easily get blown up. Uh, you can get your FBI and CIA to talk to each other. You can have better work at customs at the border. You could try to figure out why our big buddies in Saudi Arabia, why 15 of the hijackers came from a country which we have tried to protect all this time, right? Uh, you, can, you can go through the whole list, the money flow. There's a lot of things you can do. But building the kind of weapons that we have been building in this mad spending spree since 9-11 not only does not contribute to that problem, as I say in the subtitle, it weakens the country, OK? And so now, uh, let, me, let me say what I think it does about weakening the country, and then I'll end on that. It weakens the country because, first of all, the actual costs involved are serious. And people who tell me, no, you know, it's only 4% of the blah, 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 I say, fine. How come you don't tell me that when you cut welfare? You know, under President Clinton, somebody I voted for, we ended the federal obligation to deal with poor people. We don't have one anymore. Called welfare reform, but we just ended it. And the argument was it was money not being spent effectively. 
Any program like that is put under a microscope. People under, examine it and so forth. When it comes to the military spending, there are no checks at all, none. Now, we should have known this because it's built into the equation. And the reason it is, and this is what, I don't know, does anybody remember George Washington's farewell address? I've mentioned Eisenhower's. You do mention it a little bit. You know, it's incredible. George Washington, who I think is just terrific, I like the guy, despite the fact that he was a white male, um, <laughs> but I still defend him. But George Washington, seriously, you know, I, you read his, I got a big chunk of his farewell address in, in the book. Uh, here was a guy, like Eisenhower, a war hero. And by the way, I dedicate the book to both Eisenhower and McGovern. Uh, I say to two war heroes who preferred uh, plowshares to swords. And everybody always, you know, talks about patriotism, which is where I'm going at the moment. And it's interesting, when McGovern was running against Nixon, uh, Nixon savaged him and uh, challenged his, his spunk, his willingness to fight, his willingness to protect the country. He was just this hopeless pacifist. So I happened to be on a cruise, saw some people before who were on one of these Nation magazine cruises. George McGovern was on the cruise, and we were sitting there uh, uh, talking, and I asked him, I said, look, you know, I covered a lot of these things and actually interviewed Nixon and knew him and so forth. I said, but how come when you were being attacked so viciously by a guy who was a parade guard in the Navy during World War II, for your patriotism, you never once mentioned uh, that you had won the Distinguished Flying Cross for crash landing your plane to save your crew, that you had flown 34 bombing missions over Germany and they were considered suicide missions because so many planes were shot down. You never brought up your war record. And George McGovern, I asked him, I said, why didn't you bring it up? And he gave me an answer that, you know, just so classy, but you won't hear it from anybody anymore of that kind. He said, it would have been unseemly. Hmm. See? Now, people are afraid to do that. You know, sometimes I feel I ought to wear not one little American flag, I ought to have three of them. <laughs> and then I will really be uh, patriotic. But, you know, McGovern was saying, you know, he was, challenge he was challenging the whole uh, intimidation. So, when you read George Washington's farewell address, by the way, George Washington only wanted to be a one term president. Some of you are historians and all think I'm, you know, being too simplistic here, but expected to be a one-term president. He only believed in it. He got talked into going for a second term. So he had written his farewell address after his first term. And he consulted with Madison and Hamilton on it and so forth and carried this thing around or had it in his office for the next four years. And while he never gave it as an oral address, he issued it to the American people. Okay? And he warns in that address, as did Jefferson. Remember, Jefferson is one who warned us about foreign engagements. And in that speech, uh, Washington, re um, foreign entanglements was Jefferson, foreign engagements was Washington. And in that speech, he says that, he warns us about the impostures of pretended patriotism. And it's incredibly compelling language. And he warns us not about being involved with the world. This has nothing to do about isolationism as far as not caring. He talks. Very moving terms about the need to have intercourse with the world, to have gentle guidance of trade, to extend to others. Jefferson, of course, was not an isolationist in the sense that he did not want to be involved with the world. Uh, you know, it has nothing to do with being indifferent to the world. It has nothing to do, actually, with uh, not acting in a moral sense. This is, and going to your question, what the candidates should advocate, this has nothing to do with intervening multinationally to stop genocide. It has nothing to do with aid. It has nothing to do with missionary work, doctors without borders, anything. It has to do with empire. And what Washington said in that speech, he warned the citizens, if you get involved with these foreign engagements and militarily, you will not have a republic. And the reasoning couldn't be clearer. And it's really what informed Eisenhower's speech. And that is, as long as, and I know this is a journalist, because I, I think it was mentioned, I worked for the LA Times for 29 years, I wrote local columns, and I wrote national columns. And as a journalist, I know when you're covering local, local, if I said you need a street light over there, or traffic should be one way, or the school is not working, or the cops are crooked, people would write in, if I said San Juan Street is an example I use in Venice, California, I never can get it straight. I still don't know whether it's San Juan Avenue or San Juan Street. If I say San Juan Street, I would get 400 emails and letters saying, Cher, how could you be a columnist? You don't know anything. 
It's San Juan Avenue, you know? And if I said the city council decided this, people could get the meeting. We have sunshine laws. They could get the data. They could find out whether there have been accidents because there wasn't a, a, a traffic light there. They could find out whether the school has good scores or what have you. They can become informed. And what Washington was talking about is the key ingredient to a republic controlled by the people, and that's an informed citizenry. When it comes to international affairs involving military power, war, has been said, truth is the first casualty. Mm -hmm. And we know then we're dealing in an area of secrecy, classification, in which we really don't know which end is up. I remember once being at the LA Times, and I uh, got a hold of some documents that were, were being released, and it showed that, the, that Lyndon Johnson and Robert McNamara both knew in real time that there was no evidence to support the idea that we had been attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin, in the second attack, before they went to the nation and said, I've ordered, Lyndon Johnson said, I've ordered the bombing of North Vietnam to escalate that war. And for 20 years. And I went downstairs to see my publisher, Tom Johnson, who later became head of CNN, who had worked, as did Moyers, Bill Moyers, with Lyndon Johnson. He admired Lyndon Johnson enormously. And I went downstairs and I said, look, you know, there's this story here and it doesn't make your friend Lyndon Johnson look so good. You might want to read it and maybe you can give me some insight. And then when I went back to see him, he said, well, it's going to make Lady, Lyndon Johnson was already dead, he said, it's going to make Lady Bird very unhappy. Uh, but he said, you know, of course you have to print it. And I said, did you know? And he said, not really. No, I had some inkling, but not really didn't know. Uh, so that secret was even kept within the inner circles. You have a whole history of that. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I would say that in just about every major decision, what happened with the WMDs and the connection between Iraq the non-existent connection between Iraq and Al-Qaeda and so forth and so on, is the norm, not the exception. Until we got the Pentagon Papers, we didn't know that the guy we had designated to be the George Washington of Vietnam, No Dinh Diem, ended up being killed in a plot that we were complicit in and had knowledge of, okay? Uh, so you can go right down the list. And so basically, when it comes to having the data you need to have this key ingredient uh, to function, in a democratic society, an informed public, you don't have it. And certainly not in the era of mass media, where basically what's called journalism is functioning as a conveyor belt for leaked information uh, that serves generally the people in power. And, and so the real issue here is not just the waste of money, which is substantial, but the fact that the people who build these things will want to use them, will define the world in a way that makes their use more necessary, more compelling, and uh, at the end of the day means that secrecy, classification, and the destruction of freedom become the norm. Okay, so I'm not gonna go on uh, much any longer. I just did promise this gentleman I addressed the question of what the candidates can do. And uh, I do think you should force this to become an issue in the election. Both candidates now say that we need to spend more on the military, not less. It is a shame that they are not challenged by, on this by the media. It is a shame they are not challenged at public meetings. And why? What do we need? What will you do? Uh, what is it for? That's number one. Secondly, to ask them the question of why would you be different? And I'm gonna end with a, uh, a, a personal note on this. Again, I mentioned one before and then I'll take questions. I think it's very important to get those answers. And I don't know if it was mentioned when I was introduced, but often it's mentioned that I, yeah, it was mentioned. I inter interviewed Jimmy Carter about lust in his heart, right? Okay. And uh, actually I didn't. I interviewed him about being the first major candidate in modern times to wear your religion on your sleeve and talk about how many times a day you prayed down in that first Baptist church in Plains. And so my real question was, you know, wait a minute, does it, to what degree will this inform your presidency and wh how does it relate to your position on all sorts of social questions. It was a perfectly legitimate thing to be discussing. Carter understood that. He gave a very sensible answer. Anyone who read that would know it. He said, look, you know, I'm human. I'm not out to convert everybody. I believe we're all struggling with the devils inside us and everything. I've lusted just like anybody else, and so I'm not going to be running. I'm not the Ayatollah. You know, it's basically what that was. But there was a much more controversial point in that interview that at first got some attention, then was ignored by lust as 
sex always trumps. Remember when Clinton did, finally did the right thing about bin Laden and sent those cruise missiles in after yeah. all these people have been attacking us? Remember what he was accused by the Republicans? Yeah, the dog. No, yeah, taking, uh, drawing attention away from the important matter of testimony in the Paula Jones uh, uh, case. Okay, so here I asked Jimmy Carter, I said, look, you know, you're this guy, you, you, now the Democratic nominee. I said, uh, we had a Democratic president who got us into the war in Vietnam. I said, why w would we think you would be different? And, because, you know, after all, I don't want to belabor this, but the Democrats have been the war party as often as they've been the peace party, you know, and we have plenty of liberal neocons that are just as fierce as conservative neocons. So I asked him that question, and he said something very simple in that Playboy interview. He said, I would never lie to the American people the way Lyndon Johnson did. Very serious statement. Now, uh, Lady Bird Johnson would not meet. I happened to be on the plane covering them then. She would not meet him in Dallas. It was a big flap, but it got papered over, and then lust has, has its way triumphed. But it's an interesting answer, because in fact, Jimmy Carter, who's been a great ex-president, a great ex-president, second to none, all right, wasn't a terrifically good president. And um, I, I lose any potential book sale by this kind of comment. Uh, but, but I'm sorry, I feel compelled to point this out. I, I love the man, I love him as an ex-president, it's great, okay? But one of the things that Jimmy Carter did was, uh, when we talk about lying to the American people and getting us into a problem, he followed Zbigniew Brzezinski's advice over the objection of Cy Vance, who was his uh, <coughs> Secretary of State, and he decided to what Zbigniew Brzezinski referred to in an interview with Nobel Observator, to give the Russians their Vietnam. And that meant supporting the Mujahideen in Afghanistan against the Soviets. Okay. That's where it began. It can begin with liberals and Democrats and well-intentioned people, okay? And I remember in my book, I have an incident because we, I bring it up because uh, Richard Holbrook, who was one of the top advisors to Hillary and I'm sure will emerge as a leading candidate for Secretary of State should the Democrats win. Richard Holbrook, when Jimmy Carter was president, I happened to be at a dinner at Norman Lear's house. I report the incident in my book, Norman Lear, terrific television producer, all in the family, all of that. And Richard Holbrook came to this dinner with Joan Baez, of all people, great piece of it. And they had just been with Rosalind Carter in Thailand, okay, uh, visiting a camp of people who were trying to get back in power in Non Pen, Cambodia, a country I knew quite a bit about. I had been there in 64, I'd been there later, and then I went back there 11 years ago. So a country that I care a great deal about. Never needed any social change, certainly didn't need to have millions of its people killed. And the guy who killed it, the communist killer, bloody, Pol Pot. So they come back, and we're at this dinner party, and he's laying out that they're supporting a coalition, and the Carter administration is supporting a coalition in Thailand that includes Pol Pot mm -hmm. to get back in power in Phnom Penh. Why? Because the Chinese were backing Pol Pot. They had always backed him. The Vietnamese had overthrown Pol Pot, and they were backing Hun Sen. The fact that millions of people have been killed by this butcher <laughs> didn't matter at all. It didn't matter. This is the world of real politics. I only bring it up because when people talk about, well, we, the neo, the liberal hawks are better than the conservative hawks because the liberal hawks are interested in human rights. It ain't necessarily so, okay? Cynicism uh, can dominate. And so, uh, and the question of Carter and uh, Afghanistan. There's blowback, and unless we understand the blowback, unless we understand the consequence of our actions, we never learn from our mistakes. And if, if we ever find out, you know, and somebody here will probably say, what happened on 9-11? Did the building go down? Didn't that building go down? It'll ruin the whole evening because we'll have to argue about the dynamite and everything else. I've been at these meetings. But before we get there, you know, uh, let me just say, there's a lot we don't know about 9-11. There is, and I don't blame people for having these flights of fancy or so forth, because we have very little information. And it goes back to this thing I was just telling about Blowback and Carter, okay? If you read the 9-11 Commission report, 
I think it's page 176, I can't remember. That's part of being 72, but it's around there. There's a disclaimer, a big box. And in this disclaimer, the members of the 9-11 Commission say, our narrative, our basic narrative about what happened that day is based on the testimony of key witnesses. These are the nine, 10 people in Guantanamo, basically. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, supposed to be the mastermind, and others. And they say in that disclaimer, and these people all have the highest security clearances. They have been handpicked by the President of the United States. They said, we were neither able to interview those people, the key witnesses, nor were we able to interview, allowed to interview the people who interrogated them. So your narrative is based on, based on what people who have been tortured systematically have told their interrogators, the interrogators have told their superiors, and that is what was passed on. Okay, But even if we take that narrative, the mastermind of 9-11, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, met bin Laden in Afghanistan, where both were recruited by our CIA, CIA uh, by, you know, in this effort to help the Mujahideen. Now, after all, uh, Carter had moved on, Reagan had a Freedom Day for them and so forth. And I would argue that one reason why we have not had public trials is because we really don't want to know too much about this. Our government doesn't. That if you had public trials and you really had cross-examination, you might learn some uncomfortable details about who these people are and what they were doing and what drove them to it. I think that's also true, by the way, had we had a public trial of Saddam Hussein regarding events after the ones he committed. After all, all that Saddam Hussein was convicted of, and he certainly was a bloody, uh, horrible uh, killer, but the things he was convicted of were all crimes committed before we befriended him. Don't forget that. I mean, you don't know this from cable, I understand, and even from the New York <laughs> Times. But the fact is, what this man was convicted of are all things that happened before Donald Rumsfeld went over there to embrace him, representing Reagan. It would have been really interesting to have a trial in which Saddam Hussein actually got to blow the lid off this. I suspect that might have had something to do with why he didn't uh, get the second trial. But at any rate, there's a lot to be known about this. But finally, I do want to make one last point about the imperial venture and about this book. I don't know where idealism, misplaced idealism ends and greed enters. I, in the book, make no judgment of the people involved. I assume most people who make weapon systems really believe we need the systems. I assume people lobbying really believe it, because it's not all that difficult to talk yourself into these things. And I'll give you one example. Richard Pearl, who's been called the Prince of Darkness, somebody I've known ever since he worked for Scoop Jackson, the Democratic senator from Washington, who used to be called the senator from Boeing. And I profiled Scoop Jackson for Esquire. I knew him quite well. And uh, Richard Pearl, a lot of neocons, Paul Wolf, was come out of that. What they were coming out of was objecting to Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon had had the opening to China, had had the uh, detente with the Soviets that he uh, accelerated. They felt betrayed by that. And that neoconservative movement really goes. So here you have Richard Pearl, who's been pushing this forever. But I just want to end on one note about where, why I don't deal with motives, because I don't know. But I know it's in our system. And that Richard Pearl wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal, I have it in the book, where he said, we need these air tankers up there. Must have them. Anyone in the Pentagon objects to just being narrow-minded, uh, green eye shade, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. He did not tell his editors, and he did not tell the readers of the Wall Street Journal that he had already received $20 million from Boeing for his venture capital firm. Okay? Now, I only offer it up not to say Richard Pearl is particularly, particularly, um, um, what's the right word, uh, aggressive in both areas, doing well by doing good, but that that's the norm. And at the universities now, defense money, private money from, from these institutions, uh, if you look at the campaign financing, you look everywhere, and you see that it's really, it's totally within our system. And what it does, finally, is that it distorts your view of the world. And so Iraq will not be the last war. You will go on to other adventures, because these toys, they're not totems to be worshipped at. They are things to be used, or we don't go on paying for them. So let me end on that and have questions. But it would seem to me, to much of the world, we look disconnected from our moorings. We're not good at things that we're supposed to be good at. 
First of all, we're supposed to be good at having checks and balances. It's something we've advertised to the rest of the world. We have a First Amendment, okay? That means we have an independent press. You should have one. We tell everybody in the world, I share that. Yes, you should have one, you know? Then they turn around and say, yeah, but how come your uh, independent press went along with these lies in the main, you know? Uh, then you have separation of powers. And we have a model in our Constitution. You know, well, why didn't your independent judiciary check this? Why didn't your Congress claim its right to declare war? Uh, you know, what was this all about? And so I think we've uh, shamed our institutions. We've identified ourselves with torture. Uh, you know, here was uh, John McCain, who was, you know, very concerned about this, right, when he was in the Senate, but then as a candidate, increasingly, and then he gives Bush a blank check on this. I mean, did you ever, any enemy of this country, if they could have identified our image with torture in the way this president has, you couldn't have a more dangerous, subversive activity of the American dream, the American ideal, than this president did, okay? I mean, if this guy is a double agent, you know, or something, all right, I'm not gonna spread, <laughs> not, not putting that theory out. So yes, but I would think, the other thing is, we have given up what we're supposed to be good at. We no longer have the confidence that we can make superior goods that we can have better ideas, that we can sell things, and we're back to a very old-fashioned, discredited model that we want Pax Americana, that what we're good at is making weapons and using them. And that is a discredited model of modern economic and, and political activity. I just got out of the store with this memory. Ensure four million kids who don't have health insurance cost you two subs that we don't need, all right? No one ever puts it that way, you know? Why are you spending $300 billion on a new fighter plane for the services? It sounds great. You know, it was even a cost-cutting thing. They'll all share one plane. We'll have variations. It's a $300 billion program. That's not chump change. And I've, I've only, you know, hit some of the systems here. So what I'm saying is you have the right to demand where, to know where this money's going, why is it going there, and why is it not going to the other things, all right? Let me end on that. And, uh...